And also, yeah, we, we have here an Italian case of two years ago. I'm, I'm, not aware, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware if there has been a litigation here. What I have heard about, uh, you know, newspapers is that uh, Jorit, a very famous uh, uh, Neapolitan street artist, you know, uh, complaining about the use uh, of his mural, not San Gennaro, you know, <laughs> and here in 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 a, in, a, in advertising a message by this uh, beer producer. I, I'm not sure. Probably it has been settled out of court. Uh, okay. So first of all, we need to verify whether street artworks and especially graffiti, graffiti pieces are original because originality is one of the requirements huh, for copyright protection. Of, of course, when it comes to street art, so to figurative elements, there is no issue that most of these artworks are original, right? It's art. It's very beautiful art. There are some doubts about whether certain graffiti pieces, certain graffiti art might meet the originality requirement. What about the most hated the most hated by, 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 by society, by, the, by general members of society, the most hated form of graffiti, that is to say tags, right? On the one hand, one may say tags are just visual pollution, right? It's rubbish. It's, it cannot be considered as original art, right? This is the, the general assumption, I would say, that many people in the general public would do. It's visual pollution. But of course, if we then, see the same tag on a canvas, we might start thinking, look, this starts to being original, so this, that's, that's quite nice, I would say, but it's the same tag. The same tag on a shop shutter might be considered as uh, visual pollution, as non-original, but the same tag on a canvas might be considered as original. But, I mean, uh, th th there is no rule on originality, which compels us to judge originality, to assess the originality requirement based on the support upon which the artwork is based. That is to say, the support, a shop shot, a dustin bean, might corrupt, might uh, uh, influence our assessment of originality, which, which, should, which should be a mistake, in my opinion. There are texts that are beautiful texts. What about the other? The other requirement for protection in many countries, not, not in, um, in, in several continental European countries such as Italy, France, but for example, in, under US law, under UK law, fixation, fixation is, 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 is a requirement. Well, in Italy, we have this kind of uh, uh, extrinsication, right? That might be considered as a requirement. But uh, I mean, uh, graffiti. Most graffiti artworks, many graffiti artworks, just last for a few. Dr. Bonadio. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Could I could I inter interrupt a little bit? Kindly share yeah. your slides. It's a, it's share. I mean, you should see on the. Okay. On, can you see the slides? No. I have shared them, so probably there is a problem on okay. your on your end. Okay. Giovanni, do okay. you see the slides? No, Rico. Rico. Yes. Uh, I did not see any slide. Uh, the, oh. you, you have a green button uh, just in the middle. Uh, oh, sorry, I put share screen. Just a second. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, just let's... type on it. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, pa, 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 pa. Now, um, share. You should be able to see. All it. right, all right, all right. Right. Okay, let's let's recap a bit. I was I was presenting these uh, these cases, right? Uh, in the food, in the car industry, fashion, uh, fashion again, right? Moschino vandal case, uh, Cavalli, all these appropriation cases, right? McDonald's appropriating these. No, you can see all these cases. Most of these cases, I would say, all of these cases have been set out of court. Most of the of the recent graffiti appropriation cases have been settled out of court, right? Then I also mentioned this um, uh, Jorit a Neapolitan artist case. Uh, this beer, uh, this beer manufacturer appropriating that. I'm not sure if. Uh, if uh, if the case has gone on, probably it has been set out of court. Uh, I talked about originality and tags, right? Tags are the most hated forms of uh, of graffiti artworks, as I said, by by the by the by the general public, I would say. 
But as, as you can see here, if you see the tag on a canvas, you may start thinking that's original, right? That's not any more visual pollution, but uh, you know, our assessment of originality should not be influenced, should not be corrupted by the surface upon which, right? Upon which the artwork is, uh, is placed. Uh, there is no corporate statutes around the world which uh, you know, obliges us to take into account the support. It could be a canvas, could be a dustbin, could be a shop shutter and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, what about fixation? No, in, most, in many countries, fixation is a requirement for copyright protection. Well, um, as I've said before, copyright, uh, uh, sorry, graffiti artworks, many graffiti artworks last just for a limited period of time. In some cases, even some, uh, some hours or even minutes, I would say. This is a case, by the way, the one you can see now in this slide is a case of reverse graffiti. No, uh, artist basically uh, working on dusted uh, surfaces, and this actually is a, is a Russian artist. Uh, well, uh, the fact that uh, some graffiti artworks just last for potentially just a few minutes, hours. In my opinion, does not uh, does not uh, uh, mean that uh, the fixation requirement is not met. Under most law, fixation requirement is interpreted as uh, you know requiring the artwork to be existing uh, for a time which is uh, uh, which is enough for the public to appreciate uh, the, the the artwork. Right. So it doesn't mean the permanence. Right? It doesn't mean permanence of, of, of the artwork on a surface, right? Well, um, moving on, what about infringement, copyright infringement? Well, in this American case, uh, um, the issue was whether a, a TV series producer uh, was committing copyright infringement uh, uh, by incorporating just for a few seconds in one of its, you know, uh, fragments see, um, incorporating a graffiti artwork on the street. Basically, the, the, the two actors were walking on the street and just for a few seconds, this graffiti artwork was included in the, in the, in the, in the, in the TV series. Well, the judge here in this American case found no infringement because, because uh, the, 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 it was just a short period of, uh, just, just, a, just a few seconds, basically. And of course, if the incorporation is de minimis, is just minimal, uh, there cannot be a copyright infringement. In many other countries, I would say, courts would have reached the same conclusion, let's say. Uh, this is a, a pending case. Uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, versus uh, Soto and uh, Borbande and uh, James Lewis, other graffiti artists, four graffiti uh, street artists, I would say. Basically here, uh, as you can say, Mercedes has in incorporated several of the four murals in uh, promotional uh, materials. Uh, then uh, promotional material, pictures, photographs that have been uh, uh, disseminated through the Instagram account of this uh, car manufacturer, right? So uh, the, the car manufacturer is invoking a sort of a freedom of panorama pr uh, provision which is contained in the, in the US Corporate Act for architectural works. Basically here, what they are claiming is that the mural is automatically incorporated in the, in the building, right? Uh, so the artist painting on the, on the building results in the mural being incorporated in the architectural work. Since there is a provision in the Copyright Act in the US which exempts from copyright infringement the incorporation of architectural works on the street in the public environment, so that's what they are, that's what Mercedes is, is, uh, is invoking. But, so we will see in a few, probably in a few weeks or months, the decision will be out and it will be a very, very important decision. Uh, vale, adesso well, c'è una cosa. Compra le cosce. Excuse me, excuse me. Quelli che hai comprato in... Elina, may you, may you mute your microphone, please? Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you, Elina. Uh, 
so uh, let, we'll see in the future what 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 this decision will be. But it's a very important decision yeah. because if you, you can see if the if the judge here, if the court here says that uh, there is no copyright infringement because well that might have a, a real a real impact on future behaviors, right? Because of course uh, appropriators uh, companies or anyway, whoever appropriates works on the street, artworks that are painted, that are placed on architectural buildings may invoke this, this exception, this uh, freedom of program exception. So uh, uh, let's watch out this case very closely because it, it might change. It might change this, the whole scenario, in America at least. Uh, most of these artworks, street artworks and graffiti artworks are made illegally. Right, without the authorization of the copy of the of the of the artist, and and uh, without the authorization of the of the of the property owner. Sorry. Uh, so what does it happen here? Uh, is copyright still uh, there if the artist does not does not ask the authorization from the property owner? But basically, it is illegal. So in the U.S., some commentators and some lower courts, a lower court that is in a case. They have invoked the so-called unclean hands doctrine. So since the hands of the artist are not clean, basically since the artist has committed a crime, vandalism, trespass, uh, and so on and so forth, he cannot or she cannot invoke copyright here, no? against infringers, against appropriators. Uh, in this case in America, in the US, um, it was a case about an appropriation of, of an artwork in a book. Uh, however, a judge said, auditor, that whether the defender would be liable for copyright infringement, so whether the appropriator would be liable for copyright infringement, would depend on the factual question of illegality, suggesting that the issue of illegality is key for copyright subsistence, subsistence purposes. But it was just a lower court, it was an obiter, so there is no settled cases, I would say, settled case law on this matter. My own position is that this doctrine, the unclean hands doctrine, is not suitable to govern uh, graffiti cases of graffiti appropriation, illegal graffiti appropriation. Who appropriates the art? So for example, the corporation is not the victim of the, of the criminal act. The victim of the criminal act is the property owner, right? Uh, which who is not even involved in these disputes. So, in my opinion, accepting the unclean hands doctrine could be and would be absurd, would lead to an absurd result because it would end up rewarding people, companies that are not the victim of the vandalism. Of the vandalism. Basically, it would legitimize co-option of street art, but not its very creation, right? Uh, in my opinion, corporate and the corporate is blind uh, towards uh, the, 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 the illegal artwork. So the process of creating the artwork, whether legal or illegal, should be relevant under corporate. Uh, copyright and law and criminal law should be separate here, right? You may, you may, you may want to claim, uh, you know, uh, uh, compensation for the appropriation of the artwork, even if the artwork has been created illegally, even if the artist may face um, legal consequences, even jail time in some countries, right? Some, many writers, many street artists have spent uh, time in jail for, you know, for uh, uh, creating illegally artworks. But the next question is, is it really convenient for writers and street artists to come out and to invoke copyright for illegally created artworks? Well, they may risk prosecution for that. It, it would be like an act of confession, right? However, however, after the statute of limitation expires, a few years, depending on the, on the, on the, on the jurisdiction, six, seven, eight, nine years, the statute of limitation applies, so there might be an interest, right, in uh, enforcing copyright there because the artist does not uh, run any risk anymore, right? And this is what happened in this case. In this case, uh, McDonald's created this, this tag, this graffiti throw up, and uh, 
the the artist was dead at that time. Uh, Dash Snow died, died in 2009, more or less. And who took legal action against the uh, against the, uh, uh, McDonald was the was the fiance. The the, 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 the the legal action is not pending anymore, um, but uh, it has been decided by the judge in California on procedural grounds, however, because of lack of jurisdiction, not on substantive grounds. Mm -hmm. uh, I have mentioned before the freedom of panorama exception, right, which is relevant here because these artworks, these artworks are placed on the public environment. So the freedom of panorama exception is a kind of exception which is present in some copyright laws around the world, France, uh, UK, US, we have seen. Uh, basically, uh, uh, it is available mainly for sculptures, for architectural works, for example, under US, under UK law, uh, but not for uh, pictorial, uh, figurative uh, paintings, let's say. Some, and most street artworks are paintings, right? So basically, uh, in this case, uh, Adrian Falken versus General Motors, again, a car manufacturer here, was appro appropriated this mural, and uh, the judge, the court here, said, uh, no way, no way the, 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 the appropriator here can claim the architectural works freedom of panorama exception. Remember, we mentioned it before. Uh, uh, it is not incorporated, the mural, said the court, is not incorporated in the architectural work because when the artist painted the, the, the work, did not have any intention to incorporate his painting in the concept, in the architectural uh, work. So basically the, the, the building has been used just as, uh, as a support without merging, right, the two, the two works. So, and as I said, the freedom of panorama is not available, the freedom of panorama exception is not available for paintings in, under US law, under UK law, and in several other jurisdictions. Uh, if we read, if we read the, the, the decision, some findings of the court in this case, it's, it's, quite, it's quite revealing. The judge said, there is also no indication that the mural was designed to appear as part of the building or to serve a functional purpose that was related to the building. Instead, there is evidence that the artist, Smash 137, was afforded complete creative freedom with respect to the mural. The artist was not instructed that the mural should play a functional role with respect to the garage. No, the, 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 the building was a parking garage, right? Very interesting uh, finding. And as I said before, uh, this is uh, the issue in the, in the Mercedes uh, case. We will see if the court follows the previous decision. It's a very important case, as I said, because it would change behaviors in the future. So if the court in the Mercedes case said that uh, uh, the appropriator, the car manufacturer here, uh, can get away with this, can invoke this uh, uh, freedom of panorama exception for architectural works, well, there might be a chilling effect on, effect on street artists, you know, painting freely on, uh, on on um, on um, on uh, public buildings uh, in in America. So, having said that, let's uh, move on and let's face a more philosophical, you know, question: Is copyright fit to regulate these forms of creativity? Because these forms of creativity are often anti-establishment, right? Copyright. Uh, uh, sorry, street artists and graffiti writers. Most of them, at least, the narrative says. Uh, are not really bothered about uh, uh, about uh, you know uh, invoking property rights. Actually, what they do often is to uh, infringe property rights of the property owner, the tangible property here. Uh, however, we might counter argue by saying, look, copyright should also be neutral with re with reference to the content, with reference uh, to the to the motivations which which trigger street artists and graffiti writers to paint. I mean, also, there are many fine artists, no? artists that paint canvases, that carry, that convey anti-establishment messages. And of course, we have no doubts there, there is no doubt there that uh, 
uh, copyright is available for anti-establishment fine artists. So the same should be said of street artists and graffiti writers, right? What about, um, I have mentioned before the economic rights, what about uh, uh, moral rights? Can moral rights, so for example, the right of integrity, the right of uh, artists to oppose uh, uh, prejudicial treatments of their artworks, can street artists and graffiti writers invoke the moral right of integrity to save the artwork, to preserve, to conserve the artwork? Well, this is a big, a big issue. A big issue which has been dealt with by US courts in a very recent case, very famous case, the Five Points case, yet you may have heard. So in this case, basically the property owner had allowed in New York, we are in, the, in Queens, in New York, Long Island, the, the, the property owner had allowed artists to paint on this site, very big, very, which had become very famous, attracted lots of visitors, tourists, uh, many artists from all around the world painted there. At one point in 2013, the, the property owner decided to, to, to whitewash. To, to destroy, to cover with the cheap white paint the artworks. Well, 21 uh, street artists uh, they don't, and, and writers didn't like that. They took the they took um, they took the the property owner to court, and in 2018, the judge awarded the 21 artists 6.7 dam million damages in uh, as an award of damages. Why? Because the property owner had. Uh, violated the, 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 the moral rights provision of the Visual Artists' Rights Act in America, which, which uh, give artists, which gives artists, visual artists, the right to prevent the destruction of their artworks if their artworks are considered of recognized stature. So very a threshold for artistic merit. And uh, mm, uh, of course, in case of destruction, the artist may ask for damages under this law. The, the judge and the Court of Appeal just a few months ago confirmed this, this big award, $6.7 million uh, awards. But this case is very important because it has been the first time in America that graffiti artworks had received VARA protection, protection under this law, uh, and got this huge amount of, of, of money as damages. It's the first time, basically, that street artworks have been treated as fine artworks. So it's, it's a revolutionary ruling, in my opinion, because it has narrowed the gap between uh, fine art and street, uh, and street art. Uh, of course, there is a tension here between property owners and artists, right? There is a tension. And we need to find a balance. The balance need to, needs to be, find on a case, to be found on a case-by-case -case basis, of course, by taking into account several factors. The existence of any agreement, if any, between the property owner and the artist. Agreement to paint, to, 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 to do artworks on the building, on the property. The length of time the artwork has been allowed to, to stay there. The advantages obtained by the property owner from the piece and the public interest served by the proposed new use of the property once the street artwork is removed from the building, for example, right? The change of destination of the building, necessary adaptation to modern functional requirements, the cost for the property owner to maintain the, 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 the street artwork incorporated in the property, whether there has been a commission, of course, whether there has been a commission or whether the artwork has been painted illegally, for example, or whether the owner, for example, is an organization on which a moral duty lies to take good care of cultural heritage. So several factors should be taken into account in several jurisdictions, not only America, of course. What about the destruction of illegal street art? In this case, Ron English case, well, the judge, the court was quite sure, of course, the artist has been um, as 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 introduced as as uh, produced the artwork illegally. Of course, the property owner is able to remove it, to destroy it. No? It's reasonable, no? Otherwise, artists could effectively freeze the redevelopments of vacant lots by placing artwork without permission. Right? This is not uh, what 
um, the law should allow. But however, uh, in the following case, Pollara, the court was quite flexible, was, was retracting a bit from the previous case by saying, well, there is no basis in the statute, Vara, to find a general right to destroy works of art that are on property without the authorization of the property owner. So it's still a gray area of the law, whether or not the property owner should be able to destroy the illegally created artwork in America. In, uh, in, in, the, in Germany, for example, it, there was this case from you know, 1995, it was a case about the destruction of a, an artwork on the Berlin Wall. Uh, well, the court said that the moral right of integrity is available against destruction, even for illegally created works, but can be enforced, can be enforced, uh, can be enforced uh, against the, the um, um, it cannot be enforced against the owner of the of the of the of the of the of the property of the tangible support. It may be enforceable against third parties that uh, destroy the artwork, right? So it was a quite balanced uh, approach used by the German court here. Uh, um, I skip some slides because it's a bit uh, it's a bit uh, late. What about uh, decontextualization of street artworks and graffiti? Uh, Eric, take, uh, take your time. I mean, I take your time. Okay, don't, okay. don't be in a hurry. Thank you. Okay, okay. So I can go back. Uh, there is little doubt, uh, as far as the extraction of street artworks is, is concerned, there is little doubt that in certain circumstances, artists should accept the fact that placing their art on other people's properties may carry the risk of losing control over such artworks. I mean, also from my ethnographic research, what I found, of course, is that most the artists, most the writers, especially writers, I would say, I have interviewed, they said, oh, I don't care. I mean, I expect the fact that uh, the property owner is going to cancel it, to destroy it. At the end of the day, it's not my property, right? They accept it. Most of them accept it. Even, even, uh, even where they have been authorized or commissioned by the property owner, right? Uh, and also, under the US law, VARA, if the property owners behaves legally, for example, by serving the 90 days written notice to the artist in order to allow them to remove the artworks that are removable without damaging the, the, the piece, well, uh, this is okay. I mean, um, however, unfortunately, in the five points case, uh, the property owner, Mr. Wolkoff, did not follow this procedure, did not give this notice. That's why the judge was quite annoyed and condemned him as well. So, um, also, property owners may be obliged on safety grounds to, to remove the wall or other surfaces where the artwork is, are placed for safety reasons, right? And also, artists' attempts to prevent, to prevent the destruction of their artworks have sometimes been rejected by courts on safety grounds. Makes sense, right? We cannot really risk the lives of people living there. Uh, if, and, and so the property owner might act to and remove the artwork. I was mentioning before the, the decontextualization, what I call the de decontextualization of, um, of street art. Basically, the surgical, removal of the artwork, the relocation of the mural from, from, from the wall into an indoor, no, from the outdoor natural environment into an indoor gallery, a museum, uh, uh, and exposure of the, of the removed artwork, often for profits. For example, for the purposes of being, of the artwork being uh, sold, uh, auctioned, and so on and so forth. Okay, this uh, has happened with several uh, Banksy's murals, for example, no? such as this case uh, from, North, from North London uh, Street to a gallery, to an auction house. Um, here is, this, uh, is a case with Stick. Stick is a famous London artist. He painted this mural in Poland in 2011. It was a community mural, with, also with other 
he, he painted with kids, local kids. It was a, a charity, I would say, a community mural. After a few years, they uh, chopped the pieces of the artwork, resurfaced in a West London gallery and offered for sale for around 10, 12,000 pounds each. I mean, there is no doubt, in my opinion here, that this is a case of mutilation, mutilation of the, of the artwork, also because the, 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 the whole artwork was, was, was the whole, with the 56, around 56 stick men and stick, stick children, no stick is this figure. What here they have done is to chop the artwork in some pieces. So not only decontextualization, but also mutilation, I would say. Well, this case uh, was settled. I mean, there was no legal action here. There was just out of court complaint, and then the case was recently settled. Uh, but the terms and conditions of the, of the settlement are unknown. Um, well, under US law and UK law, uh, there is no express right to prevent decontextualization. The integrity right does not explicitly include the right to oppose decontextualization. Under US law, for example, uh, site-specific works are not covered by the by moral rights law, by the VARA, as has been confirmed by this case, Kelly versus Chicago. It was a case regarding environmental art, as we can see from this picture. Site-specific works cannot be saved, basically, under this piece of legislation in America. Well, we had a case in Italy, basically, also a few years ago. It was not a judicial case, but you may have heard about Blue, the most famous Italian street artist, basically uh, uh, complaining about uh, the removal of some of his artworks in Bologna and the relocation of such artworks uh, in a museum, in, a, in, a museum in, in, in an indoor space for, for an exhibition, a street art uh, uh, exhibition. Well. Uh, Blue didn't 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 really accept. He took it personally, I would say, and and uh, went to Bologna and started erasing, cancelling himself his own artwork in protest. Well, uh, as I said, there was no case here, but it has attracted the case has attracted uh, uh, media attention. What I can say here is that uh, 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 after a few weeks, that the, you know. Exhibition was uh, was uh, you know, with tickets, so people had to pay a fee. But after a few weeks, uh, uh, the artworks were available for 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 you know for visiting for free, and uh, the artworks uh, had been saved say, from destruction because they were doomed to 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 disappear. However, it's a case of decontextualization. Under Italian law, I'm not sure. I mean, there are some, the, the, the integrity law, of course, provision, and there have been cases of, of, of uh, sculptures uh, and uh, they are being, being removed. And it seems the judges there, they, 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 had, they said that the, an artist has a right to prevent a decontextualization decontextualization of the of the sculpture but so far we haven't had cases in italy um, on decontextualization of street art let's say so it's still a gray area of law in several jurisdictions let's say i would say uh, um, uh, moving moving on um i've 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 mentioned before no uh, whether the, the question the issue of whether corporate is fit to regulate uh, street or graffiti art to to uh, now we have seen you know, street art is anti-establishment, but this is not really a good argument because to say that corporate should not be available for anti-establishment art. I mean, there is no issue in the corporate laws of all countries, let's say. There is no provision in, in corporate statute saying that anti-establishment art should not be protected. Uh, also, I mean, copyright here, I would say, is flexible, right? It's flexible. Copyright should be able to protect any kind of work, regardless of the content, regardless of the messages conveyed by the artwork, and regardless of the subjective, you know, uh, uh, of the subjective uh, uh, position of the artist. I mean, an artist may, including a street artist or graffiti writer, might not want to enforce copyright, and there are many out there many street artists and writers that do not want to enforce copyright. They basically waive their rights when some appropriators 
you know, step in, appropriate the artwork, and they don't start a collection, they just wave their rights, they just uh, let it go. However, we could also see that copyright, that's why I said copyright is flexible, because it could also be the tool, the legal tool, to keep the message anti-establishment. So in many of the, uh, of the cases I have introduced at the beginning, especially in America, the, 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 the artists in the complaint, the legal complaints, what they have done is to invoke copyright, so to ask an injunction, to ask the judge for an injunction, in order to prevent the association of their art with the consumeristic message for profit messages. Basically, these street artists, they don't want to be associated with the McDonald's, with the car manufacturers, with the fashion designers. Uh, they don't want to be uh, corrupted by these uh, messages. So basically, they are trying to use copyright to keep the message anti-establishment. So you can see how copyright is flexible here, right? Uh, also, street artists, and again, I mentioned here Stick, the London artist, they use copyright for social purposes. So what Stick does here is to license out his artwork to the NHS, the National Health Service in, the, in the England, in the UK, to charities organizations such as uh, uh, LGBT um, groups uh, to sponsor, to promote social causes, right? And what the artist here does is to tie the user. Basically what he does is to request the user, the NHS, the charity organization, to use the stickman, the artwork, in a way which is approved by the artist, right? That's a way of controlling the artwork by relying on copyright. But you want to sell out, you want to make money out of your street art, of course you can do it. And there are many artists out there that do that. They do merchandising, they, they license out their artwork for commercial purposes, whether to pay the bills, to put food on the table, or just for making money. There are out there many artists that are getting rich uh, by licensing out their artwork because they become famous, of course. Obey, Giant Obey, Obey, Shepherd Ferry is one of them. I mean, you can see how corporate is flexible here. You want to sell out, corporate is there. You want to send uh, social messages, corporate is there. You want to uh, avoid, anti anti to avoid uh, consumerist association, corporate is there with injunctions, right? So flexibility. What about another issue? sharing and appropriation features of street art and, and graffiti art. As uh, we know, street artists and writers borrow, borrow from each other, borrow from popular cultural imagery, uh, borrow from uh, consumeristic, when they you know, uh, think about also pop artists, right? Uh, borrowing from uh, advertising uh, imagery. Well, someone has said, some commentators have said, look, since street artworks and graffiti artworks borrow often from uh, other artworks, other street artworks from popular culture, uh, well, um, copyright is not uh, and should not be um, um, uh, available. I mean, copyright is not uh, appropriate when there is massive uh, uh, appropriation and sharing here. Well, we can see some faces. Here is the most famous uh, Banksy artworks, right? Uh, artwork uh, uh, Banksy probably uh, was inspired by this famous uh, picture photograph by a photographer, Micellas, of a Nicaraguan, a Nicaraguan fighter during the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua. Or uh, uh, Banksy, of course, has borrowed a lot from a French artist who is Black Lerat right? A French a pioneer, French uh, stencil artist from the 80s, 90s. And also, well, Banksy has borrowed from him a lot, and he has also admitted that. Uh, many artists accept, appreciate, even appreciate appropriation. Uh, they also uh, quote, you know, 
they also quote the reference. It's, they take it as a sign of respect. They are, many artists accept that, right? They take appropriation or borrowing as a sign of homage and respect. Well, street artists, um, some of them may also not tolerate blatant imitations and the way the way they react is by painting over, right? The artist work which has a copy there, right? Especially where there is acknowledgement of the source. So in this case, graffiti writers often resort to street justice or social norms. But the fact that they also rely on street justice and social norms does not mean that they might also need copyright, especially when there are corporations that appropriate the artworks, right? So in this case, I would say that social law, street, street justice, is complementary to copyright. I don't see as um, exclusive, as mutually exclusive. I, I, on the one hand, the social norms, on the okay. one hand, the cop. They can be uh, mutually, mutually, uh, they might mutually support, I would say, and uh, complementary, I would say. The fact that street artists, they do rely on, uh, on also street justice, on social norms, does not mean that uh, they cannot and they, they don't want to rely on copyright, I would say. Uh, so, uh, um, the fact that they don't take legal cash, of course, street artists that uh, copy each other, street artists that destroy their artworks each other, well, they don't take legal action against colleagues most of the time, right? They don't, always, never, they never do that. They are interested uh, in taking, in invoking copyright if the colleague is making money out of their, of their artworks. Is this not reconcilable with copyright and moral rights protection? I don't think so, as I said. Uh, there are also many fine artists that uh, do not take uh, legal action against uh, appropriators, even sometimes where there are there is money involved. I mean, I don't see I don't see a contradiction here. I would say. Uh, having said that, uh, is copyright for losers? I don't think so. As Banksy famously said once, that copyright is for losers. Well. Copyright is increasingly of interest to many street artists and to a lesser extent to some writers, I would say. And the cases we have seen demonstrate that, the legal cases, even though most of these legal cases have been taken by famous street artists. But also from my ethnographic research, what I have found is that even unknown street artists might try to invoke corporate even in a legal action if they had access to lawyers. Sometimes access to lawyers is being perceived as difficult by artists. They have to pay in advance. Uh, sometimes they have to spend time in lawyers' courtrooms. Uh, some of them, they think they don't have time for that. But if they had easy access to a lawyer, well, they might give a think. They might give a try, I would say. Well, once we accept that copyright is fit to uh, regulate subcultural creativity in the street, well, street artists and writers, they must, they must accept the roots of the game, right? Once we agree that, once we agree that copyright is fit, street artists and graffiti writers, they must stick to the roots. They may lose cases they bring, such as in this case, Seltzer versus in the, in the US, no? in the US. Um, Seltzer, this uh, street artist on the, on the right, you can see his poster. He was post, postering, white post, white pasting his, his poster in Los Angeles. The pop band um, um, Green Day appropriated one of his, um, one of his artworks, but here yeah, the court said that the, the use was fair. The use by Green Day was used, so there was not copyright infringement. It was a transformative fair use, said the court. They may also be condemned for copyright infringement. Here, the famous brainwash street artist, well, he's a studio artist, street artist. In this case, what he did is to, to copy and stencil 
the famous, uh, you know, the famous photograph by Friedman of the Randy MC pop band. This is an iconic picture. What he did was to stencil basically this picture on, on a canvas, on a wooden, on a wooden canvas. So it, so, so it was not a street art, it was a studio artwork, but still uh, here the, the court in, um, in California said that uh, uh, the, the, the two hard talks were substantially similar, so uh, the, the, the artist here was condemned for copyright infringement, no fair use. Um, the, the same artist was condemned again, brainwashed Thierry Guetta, was condemned for copyright infringement because he appropriated in the mural and in, in, in other artworks the famous, the famous uh, photograph by uh, Sid Vicious, right? The punk, the punk musician. Well, again, no copyright, uh, no copyright, no, 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 no fair use was found and the artist was condemned. So, I mean, as I said here, once we, 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 we accept that copyright is fit to address, to regulate this creativity, subcultural creativity, artists, they should accept the rules of the game. They may win, they may lose, they may be condemned and so on and so forth. So, um, for example, in this case, Shepard Ferry, you, you, you may remember this famous Obama poster, right? In the 2008 presidential campaign, the successful presidential campaign, it, it has become an iconic uh, imagery. Shepard Ferry transformed, let's say, the, the picture no, of uh, the senator of, then senator of Illinois, uh, Barack Obama. He was sued by Associated Press, which owned the rights over the, over the picture, over the photograph. The case was settled out of court, but here the court basically pushed <laughs> uh, Shepard Ferry, the street artist, to, 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 to settle because uh, otherwise, basically, he would have lost. So again, it was a studio artwork, it was not, it was not a street artwork, but as you can see, it is quite relevant. Uh, well, just to give some, some conclusions, um, I do believe that copyright is fit to regulate street art and, cop and, and, and graffiti creativity. Copyright is neutral, for example, does not bother, is not bothered about whether the artwork uh, should not be bothered about whether the artwork is, is created illegally or not. Copyright should be there, in my opinion. It should be neutral, neutral about the anti-established message of many street artworks and graffiti artworks. It should also be flexible, and it is, it is flexible enough to accommodate um, uh, street artists and graffiti writers' desires, I would say. What we can say is that these uh, artistic subcultures are experiencing an evolution. Of course, if you ask, if you, if you go back to the 70s, when uh, graffiti first developed in New York, nobody cared about, about corporate at that time. Nobody, but of course, they, they, do, they couldn't care less, I would say, about corporate. What they did was to just go, go, go out there in the train, in the subway train yards and bomb in the train, and they were not really thinking about, uh, about property uh, intellectual property rights. They were, they were violating property rights, basically. And some, some of them, they, they keep doing that. But the subculture has experienced, the subculture has experienced an evolution. It's not anymore the 70s. There has been an evolution. And there has been an increasingly uh, evident acceptance of uh, uh, of copyright rules and moral rights rules. And the Five Points case has represented a real uh, uh, event, a, a turning point in the evolution, right? Street artists taking action and winning against the property owner because they, want to pres they wanted to preserve and once the artwork was destroyed, were destroyed, they wanted damages for such destruction. As I said, there is an increasing interest in these legal tools, legal tools that should be considered as complementary to social norms. Social norms that keep regulating very well these subcultures. They function, they work well. Uh, social norms such as, uh, you know, reacting in case uh, the artist has been copied by, 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 by a biter, right? 
reacting by doing what? By painting over the other artist. Back in the days, one of the social norm, justice, justice norms, the, the street justice norm was to uh, threatening violence against the imitator, right? Even committing violence. So basically punishing with violence the person, the artist that, 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 that copied the other artist. Or another, another street justice norm, social norm is to, you know, to spread the news of the imitation on social media in order to, you know, to make people know about the, the gravity of the situation. These block of norms keep working, work very well. But I see these social norms as complementary to copyright, not as mutually exclusive. If you want to read a book, a very nice book on social norms in the graffiti subculture, I suggest the great book by Marta El Jadica on, copyright, on, on graffiti subculture and creativity. It's really a nice book. So this was my conclusion, and I can conclude with the last three points. Ephemerality. Uh, graffiti art has been ephemeral for a long time. It's still ephemeral to some extent. It's, it's, a, temporary, it's a temporary form of art. But now it's less temporary, I would say. The evolution has occurred. And the five-point case is, 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 is confirming that. Many street artists and graffiti writers are taking an interest in trying to preserve their work if they can. Not all, not all. And many still don't care about the fate of their works. But, you know, there has been a shift. There has been an evolution. Of course, whether or not we should save the artwork, either by relying on the moral right, the private interest on the artist, or relying on heritage laws remains to be seen. And I guess in the following in the following talk by Giovanni, we will focus on heritage laws. Probably we will mention no, uh, heritage laws as a tool, possible tool, to save these artworks. A possible tool which could be useful if street artists are not interested in enforcing their private moral right of integrity. So I can see heritage laws as a means, as a legal tool to save street artwork where street artists are not interested to pursue their own uh, private uh, interest, right? So I think this is a good bridge, Giovanni, with your own talk, right? Thank you very much, Enrico. And uh, unfortunately, you know, in uh, these online seminars, we cannot make any applause, so I'm going to... Yes. A wonderful presentation. And uh, I think that you have uh, uh, touched many points which are extremely interesting um, in the sense that, uh, as you said, there is a bridge uh, between our two presentations. Uh, I will try to be very brief in the sense that uh, uh, you gave us uh, many conclusions. Uh, I, will, I will try to pose some questions, most of all. And... Uh, um, and starting from an aspect and from a question that you made, uh, which is, uh, you, you said, is copyright uh, fit to regulate street, and street art and graffiti art? And I will just uh, slightly change uh, this question, uh, just asking, uh, is only copyright fit to regulate street art and graffiti art? In the sense that, of course, copyright is uh, uh, just one view. Uh, but there are probably other perspectives. And uh, uh, we, we have uh, several times discussed uh, this issue together, so you know what's my opinion uh, in this regard. But uh, um, I think that the other perspective is a perspective which moves from a, a strictly uh, private perspective uh, to a public perspective. Uh, I've really appreciated the, your conclusion, your last conclusion, when, when you said, uh, street arts and uh, graffiti art and urban art and art in public space. Uh, we, we should probably uh, try a taxonomy of what uh, these uh, forms of arts are. But anyway, uh, you said that uh, is less ephemeral than in the past. Uh, I think that this is very important because I think that uh, the, the, the view and also the perception uh, of uh, uh, these forms of arts uh, change from 
in the in the last decade, uh, in the sense that uh, probably uh, we are not speaking anymore about vandalism. Uh, we are not speaking anymore about uh, uh, you know some uh, weirdo guys who makes uh, letters on the on the on the in the, the tube stations. Uh, we are uh, I mean we have changed our perspective. Uh, there are many works which are committed, which are committed by the private sector, by the public sector. So we have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, drastically changed uh, the view to this kind of art. Uh, again, let's start from a, a kind of taxonomy because uh, I'm trying to share my screen and I know, let me close all the... Right. So, so just start from a, a, a very um, from, from from a kind. Of, I mean, uh, in many time in many articles uh, uh, about these uh, uh, these forms of arts, there is always a kind of uh, narration of street art which moves from the prehistoric times, from the graffiti uh, of the Roman Empire, from the, which is the meaning of the term graffiti, which is an Italian word, uh, graffiare, which means scratch. Uh, and also there is always uh, a connection with the Mexican experience with, uh, for example, Diego Rivera and, and whatsoever. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not, uh, unfortunately, uh, I teach uh, into an art faculty, but uh, I'm not, uh, um, um, I'm not an expert of art. Uh, I'm a, 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 a poorly a poor a jurist, so uh, it, it's not my field. But uh, I have the feeling that uh, in many cases, this connection uh, between uh, these uh, this new forms of art and also between graffiti art and street art is something which uh, uh, belongs to, to a narration, but it's something which is uh, not real. Uh, this is this is my, my view. I mean, again, I, I'm a, a, my, my perspective is a legal perspective. But uh, what I think is that uh, in many cases we 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 try to find this bridge where this bridge does not really exist. Uh, there is also another issue, just as a preliminary remark, uh, which is uh, may the form of art really affect the legal an analysis in the sense that uh, may the legal analysis change uh, because of the form of art. Uh, Enrico, you are much more into these, uh, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these movements, accepting that the movement exists, an art movement exists. Uh, I think that this is uh, really arguing that, that there is a... Do you want to say anything? No, no, I mean, um, yeah. I... It, it affects, I mean, it does affect the, in my opinion, it does affect the, the legal analysis, the connection. I mean, uh, the, the, it does affect, and I think the five points decision uh, is quite important there because uh, what the judge recognized there was quite revolutionary, right? Yeah. So it, it took, the, the judge, uh, it has been quite bold as a judge. I mean, if you think the judge there the in the first instance decision, it was Judge Block, which is a very age, like over 70, 75 years old. And uh, it has been, I think, the first judge that who has really looked into the essence of these forms of art. And uh, it, 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 it has been the first judge who has really appreciated the, the, the the features uh, uh, of these forms of art and being able to uh, challenge the conventional wisdom, right? That's why I like so much that reunion. Yes, yes, I, 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 go ahead. Yes, uh, sorry, no, sorry. No, sorry. No, I don't want to. I want to steal time. So please. So I, I think that your uh, these affect the legal analysis. Yes. Okay, uh, I do agree, and the the, uh, the five points case is, is a very good example. Because uh, as you said, and I agree with this, uh, we are really, uh, the, the, the decision really uh, focused on, on some specific aspects of this form of arts. Uh, on the other hand, I have to, to tell you very frankly that I'm quite bored about the fact that uh, when, you, when you touch 
this field, there is always someone who says that, I mean, uh, you never get into the street. You, the, the, there was a post on Facebook, which, which really, uh, uh, which was fun, actually, because there was this, this colleague who said, uh, we are going to talk about street art tomorrow. And, uh, or, or otherwise, uh, you, you can list the copyright uh, uh, posh guys speaking from their living room. So probably the reference was, was to some of us. And there is always this kind of approach, which is very, I mean, I think that, that, that the situation and the scenario is, is changed. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not the posh guy speaking from the living room. I'm just a lawyer and I'm a law professor and I'm trying to investigate on this issue. Uh, even if I do not belong to any artistic movement, I think that I, I can say my opinion from my perspective. So, uh, I think that the point is uh, in which case, and there are many different cases in which we can protect these works, uh, because there are many uh, extra legal aspects which affect the analysis. Anyway, so there is also another aspect, which is a quite obvious aspect, but uh, I will just consider this, that the the, 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 the view has changed also for a, for a matter of, of the beauty of the, uh, of the works. Uh, of course, this cannot be considered by the legal analysis. I mean, it's not considered also by the aesthetic of art, the beautiness of, of a work. So again, we, we cannot consider this. We, we should take into account not the beauty of the work, but uh, probably the public access and the, the, the fact that these works are site specific. This is why I'm trying to investigate this aspect in a, not only from a private perspective, but mostly from a, a, a public perspective, in the sense of the belonging of these works to the cultural heritage. And uh, in this case, I think that we should consider a preliminary question, which is a quite a dramatic question. And uh, Enrico, I, I would love to have your, your opinion uh, about this. Uh, and also, I, 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 I do apologize because I had to mute all the participants. So I apologize for this, uh, this kind of dictatorial choice. But there was two feedback and some babies roaming <laughs> <laughs> in the background. So, um, but of course, if some, if some of the participants want to make some questions or to, to, to just report your experience. Uh, they, they can write in the chat and uh, I'm going to unmute them. Anyway, uh, I think that the preliminary question is, uh, uh, who is entitled to take the choices on the preservation, on the protection of these works? I mean, does the work really belong to the owner? Does, belong, does the work really belong to the, to the author. And I think that this is a very important question because it is, it's a question which, which uh, moves from, uh, 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 and which shifts from a, a private perspective to a public perspective. Uh, is there an interest of the public? And uh, starting from, from the five points case, I think that yes, there is an interest also of the public in uh, uh, preserving, in the restoration of this kind of works. And uh, probably the, 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 the interest is mostly focused on the rights of the individuals. Why we should mm, better take into account the interest of the public. And so this is why I am investigating on the cultural heritage. As said at the very beginning of this intervention, I'm not going to give you any answers I'm just going to discuss about questions. And uh, I would really love, uh, this is also the, the approach and the purpose of uh, uh, some of the, uh, of the experience I am uh, facing through, I'm living here in Italy, is just to have the opinion of everyone. I'm really interested in the opinion of artists. I'm really interested in the opinion of uh, public entities, in the opinion of the population, in the opinions of my students of art. So, I mean, all the opinions are very accepted. And I think that we have different kind of visions. Is when you look at, uh, at the painting, 
you, you, you can see these, you can see it from the left, from the right, from top, from up. So, I mean, there are just different visions and we should consider all this kind of vision. Anyway, what, what's a cultural heritage? Uh, as, you know, as we all know, the, 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 the first definition is the convention uh, concerning the protection of a cultural heritage. Sorry. Okay. So this is uh, uh, the, 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 the cultural heritage. Uh, consider monuments, group of buildings, sites, and whatsoever. We also know that the notion of cultural heritage is enlarging and is not considering only physical aspects, but uh, uh, also the, what is called the intangible cultural heritage, uh, which of course uh, it, it considers that it involves uh, practice, representations, expressions, know-how, and whatsoever, but also uh, at least in my view, there is a, a, a different uh, uh, approach, a different perception of what uh, a cultural heritage is. So a cultural heritage is not something which is physical, it's something which is also intangible, it's something which also considers aspects which are not uh, strictly related to the material, uh, to the materiality of the, of the works. And we could consider if street art and graffiti art may belong to cultural heritage in, in which cases. I am fully convinced of the fact that we cannot uh, save everything. But on the other hand, I, I think that we cannot destroy everything. And uh, also, and this is again another starting point from which, of which we should discuss and from which we should, we should start. Uh, who take the decision about the, 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 the ephemeral aspect of a work? Who can decide this? Uh, I mean, what, you mentioned the, 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 the blue case in Bologna. Uh, as uh, many of the participants already know, uh, blue uh, destroyed some of his works uh, before an exhibition which were organized in Bologna. And, uh, do we agree with this kind of approach? Because I think that, uh, I mean, I do not have a very uh, sharp opinion, but uh, we, we could discuss about this. And uh, so, Giovanni, just, yes. just to add that the Bologna controversial case, I mean, needs to be narrated fully. Yes. Because there were also some uh, complaints by property owners that uh, had paid blue to uh, to to paint on some buildings, paint not, not not a huge amount of money, but some, you know sometimes street artists they get paid for that, no, and uh, so uh, the decision of Blue to self to destroy its own artworks raised some eyebrows amongst you know uh, some property owners that had paid Blue to do that, right. Yeah. But Enrico, uh, probably, probably you, you, you read the, uh, the book which is edited by Luca Ciancabilla, uh, yeah. Oltre il Grigio. And uh, I think that in this case, in uh, uh, Professor Ciancabilla, who is a friend, I, I don't know if he's connected or not, but uh, the, the, there are many, um, many reports of this experience. Uh, for example, if you read the, 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 the part which is being written by, the, uh, by uh, Dr. F uh, Ficacci, who is the chief of the, uh, who was the, 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 the superintendent, I think it's his English word, uh, at, at the time of the archives in, uh, in, uh, in Bologna. And uh, again, there is a different perspective. Uh, I think that one, one of the real problem in graffiti art is the fact that uh, there are too many uh, uh, presumptions and too many walls. Uh, this is, this is uh, 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 um, an involuntary and funny uh, example, uh, speaking about walls in, in street art. But there, there are walls, I mean, and uh, it, it is that we, we are not discussing. Anyway. Uh, the, the, this is, of course, an iconic experience, the Berlin experience, uh, we, we, which explain that uh, probably uh, artworks uh, do not belong to the artists, do not belong to the to private. So we all know what's happened in Berlin 
uh, less than around no more than 10 years ago. And uh, again, this is probably belong to the cultural heritage. This is fully belong in my view to cultural heritage. Uh, this is something which represents a uh, human experience, which uh, represents uh, 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 an historic, uh, an historic uh, moment in the history of Europe and the, uh, the entire world. So I think that in this case, the Berlin Wall uh, ju just represents a case of uh, how street art may belong to, to, cultural, to cultural heritage. Now we should say the same, for example, for the, from the, for the Israeli Wall, uh, for the, also for the case of, of Bologna, also for the graffiti art in Bologna. I mean, you are Italian, so you know that Bologna had, uh, in, the, in the 80s, uh, uh, they the, the were there one of the first movements of graffiti art. So this is a very important experience. Uh, anyway, there are many issues that we should take into account. The fact that the works are site specific, the fact that in many cases, the works are connected to local communities, uh, the fact that uh, there are political and social meaning behind many of the works. Uh, and also, of course, that uh, these works are displayed in public areas. Uh, you mentioned the right to panorama, which is a, a, a very interesting example. In Italy, uh, as you know, we do not have any regulation of this issue. Uh, so, uh, my research starts from these premises. Uh, who is entitled on the decision regarding the conservation and the restoration of these works? I think that this is a very uh, challenging uh, question because uh, we, are all, we are speaking about uh, the rights of individuals. Uh, and again, I will just consider this from a, a public perspective. So, I mean, you, 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 you just mentioned which are the rules on copyright and how copyright can be uh, an answer to this, uh, to this kind of question. Uh, the other a discussion is uh, uh, about the, the procedure, because we know that in the uh, American, uh, in the US law, we have the, the VARA experience, uh, which is not specifically devoted to street art, but uh, it's generally applied to street art. And, uh, but the procedure of the VARA, in my view, is not so efficient. So we may consider different uh, perspective and uh, different considerations. Uh, it's time consuming for the owner. Uh, transactional costs uh, are moved on the, on, the, on the owner of the building, uh, which in many cases hasn't commissioned any work to the artist. Uh, it is not easy, as, as you wrote also in one of your articles, Enrico, to find who is the real author of, of the work. And uh, most of all, I think that all the chances are in the hands of the owner and of the author. There are no, 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 no choices which are uh, outside this, uh, this dichotomy. Um, what is my proposal? We have discussed uh, uh, sometimes with you, Enrico, about uh, uh, my, my work in, the, in this sector. Uh, the, there are again some uh, preliminary questions. Uh, is uh, is uh, art in public space always ephemeral? I don't know. I, I think that probably it shouldn't be ephemeral. Uh, again, who, who take the decision on uh, the uh, uh, on the, 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 this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this profile on this aspect? Uh, who, who decides if uh, a work of art is ephemeral or not? Just consider the art of the past. Um, no one ever asked the Caravaggio if uh, he wanted to preserve his, his work. Uh, no one uh, uh, never asked Michelangelo if he wanted to preserve the, 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 the Sistina Chapel and so on. Uh, yes, the scenario is different, of course. There were works which were commissioned. In that case, uh, we are facing with works which are made uh, uh, spontaneously by the artist. Uh, there is also another aspect which is, uh, also, which is very interesting. Uh, may we protect exclusively the works which are commissioned by, uh, for example, public administration? Uh, 
uh, may we uh, think about conservation and restoration only for works which are commissioned by a uh, private entity? Uh, this is a very interesting issue, as, uh, as, as you know, uh, you, you mentioned the, the Jorit experience in Naples, which is my, my, uh, my birth town. And uh, there is also a very interesting experience that, that you know, the experience of the Banksy, which is uh, in, uh, uh, in Piazza Girolovini, Naples, which is protected by a glass which is put by uh, someone who is called uh, Agostino Pazzo, which means uh, in, in English, uh, Agostino the Madman. And uh, I mean, in this case, the, the conservation may we uh, commit it to uh, a private person like Agostino the Madman, and probably not. Uh, we, we should consider something which is more uh, strategic, if I may so. So in this case, I think that we, we cannot consider the restoration and the conservation exclusively for the works which are committed, but uh, for all the works which uh, uh, do belong to cultural heritage. But uh, who, who, again, who take the decision? Uh, I think that first of all, uh, as to the VARA procedure, uh, we should consider something uh, different. Um, I will be very basic as long as we are late. And uh, of course, I will not take into account the differences uh, among the single legal jurisdictions, because we have, for example, very different uh, uh, kinds of approach in the administrative law in Italy, in France, uh, and on the other side in, in the UK and uh, in the uh, in US. So uh, very basically, uh, my modest proposal is uh, just that before the destruction or the, the, the modification, the alteration of our work, uh, probably the owner should communicate this not to the artist, but directly to a public authority, which may be, for example, the Ministry of Culture of some entities belonging to the Ministry of Culture. Uh, before destroying or uh, modifying the, 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 the work, this public authority should take the decision and the decision whether the work should be protected or not. Um, in case of non, uh, or non-response, because there is also this problem. In many cases, the, 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 the public entities are very busy. And in many cases, and this is also another aspect which is very interesting, they do not have uh, the real competencies. So my proposal is also consider another aspect, just to create uh, a public commission which may include not only people belonging to these public entities, but also, for example, artists, also art experts, also lawyers, uh, but uh, we, we should consider all the aspects and uh, all the sides from which we should look at this problem. So before considering the, uh, the restoration, the conservation of, of a work, we should include all these kind of figures. Uh, of course, this is not uh, a perfect proposal. I said that it is a modest proposal in the sense that uh, I would like to know and I'm trying to collect all the opinions of the people working in this sector. Uh, all the proposals may be improved. This is obvious. So I'm very open and I'm, I'm not touchy. So you can say that this is uh, uh, something very, very weird. This is uh, completely, completely wrong. But I think that we have to find uh, some kind of solution. And uh, we should try to find this solution together. Uh, there is also an alternative, uh, mostly in uh, civil law countries, which is uh, what is already done, try making, and so making um, a kind of what in Italian we call a vincolo, so uh, a constraint on uh, historical and artistic interest. Uh, this is quite dangerous in my view because just putting a constraint on a, an entire area uh, in many cases should, should, should block uh, the, the development also of graffiti art and of street art. Uh, uh, the other proposal is that uh, in all the cases in which uh, there are some calls from street art, from the public administration, as well as from the, from the private entities. In my slide, I only mention uh, public administration, but also private entities should be included. Uh, and also just considering a budget 
for the restoration of this kind of works. Because you know that the, 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 the birth of street art uh, is something which is related to some places which were abandoned, uh, which were under destruction. And so I think that we have to consider this, that in all the commission work, we should also include the budget for the restoration of these works. Or, or otherwise, just consider from the beginning the destruction of these kinds of works. So, I mean, again, I'm not arguing that we have to preserve and that we have to keep everything. This is impossible. Uh, I, I think that, for example, I live in Rome, probably is one of the most beautiful uh, cities in the world. But uh, again, Rome is in many cases blocked into its uh, renaissance. Uh, there is nothing new. It is a... Uh, something which is wonderful but static and the art is not static i mean we, we should also consider for example uh an aspect which is very interesting and just, just let me move to this this is a very interesting case this is a very recent case of, of one week ago a couple of weeks ago uh this artist ogre made this work in the parco degli acquedotti uh, which is uh, uh, um, an archaeological site. So it is protected by the law. He made this work on something which is uh, new. In Italian, it's called tamponatura. I don't know which is the English word. Probably a figure who may help me. But uh, everything is protected. Also, the new intervention on the archaeological sites are protected. Ogre made this work. Uh, I mean, I do not agree with this kind of intervention. But I think that, it, that this is interesting. I do not agree because, let me skip to my conclusions. We have to consider collective decisions. Of course, art is a, an individual. In, in many cases, in most of the cases, art is something which is individual, is not collective. But I think that uh, it is very dangerous to think that uh, an artist may decide where he have to display his works also into an archaeological site. So this is, this is a very, again, this is a very challenging perspective. Uh, so I do not agree with the Ogres, inter the Ogres uh, intervention because it's uh, uh, an individual intervention he decided that something was wrong in that side. And also, uh, we, we have to consider that before the, the Ogre intervention, uh, there was a, 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 a phallic, uh, I don't know if I say a bad word, I don't know if phallic exists in English. So that there was a cock before the Ogre's intervention. And uh, he made something which is, uh, of course, again, uh, beautier than a cock. But uh, who have to decide this? I think that this is a crucial question. So this is why uh, I do not fully agree. But I think that this intervention is interesting because uh, we should also consider street art into artistic sites, into archeological sites. We should also consider not only street art. I mean, street art, again, let's move from a taxonomy, modern art and the integration of modern art with ancient art. I think that this is a very challenging perspective that we should take into account. Some very confused conclusion. We need the involvement of the public, in my view, in my proposal, in this commission, in many cases where the works are considered to be site-specific, we should consider the involvement of the public. We should take and we should consider the fines for the restoration of these works. Not in all the cases, because I mean, again, I'm not saying that we have to keep everything. This is unjust, this is unreal. I mean, we, 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 I'm not accepting this and I'm not arguing this. I want to be very uh, precise on this. I'm just consider that on the one side, we cannot keep everything. On the other side, we cannot destroy everything. So the crucial point is, again, who takes the decisions? 
My proposal is a collective decision with the commission, with, with, with a committee of experts, of lawyers, of artists. Uh, I mean, this is only a proposal with the involvement of the public. So that's it. It's over, and I would be very curious to know your opinion regarding this uh, proposal. Uh, I am unmuting all the participants, so feel free to pose your questions to me or to Professor Bonadio. Just give me a minute, please, because it's not that easy to unmute. Ah, I unmute all. So. Yes, if you have hello. 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 Okay, so I uh, I'm an assistant professor from India, and I have a question uh, to Ernico. Yes. Um, uh, you'd mentioned at one point that uh, there, there was a slide which said that is copyright fit for graffiti. Now, uh, and then again, you mentioned about Marta Ijaldiga's book, uh, wherein it says looking beyond copyright, and it uh, consistently talks about the fact that uh, this graffiti and graffiti artists do not very much need copyright because even without them, they have been functioning uh, much as well as they were before. So, and uh, that being the question, is there any need for copyright to protect graffiti when laws still consider it close to vandalism and they can hardly come out in the society and fight any case? There is still need. I mean, as far as the Copyright Act of that particular country uh, does not deprive illegally created street artists of protection, yes. As far as I know, there is no a corporate statute. Um, that explicitly uh, says that illegal artists uh, should not be protected by copyright, right? It's just a matter for right. judges and courts, not to interpret to, to interpret existing rules. Uh, right. So, if this prohibition is not there, so if uh, I mean, uh, but your question is more related to the, to the perception, right? To the perception. I mean, yes, in, the philosophical you, aspect. You said that in many countries, not America, for example, which is, a bit, of course, the graffiti was born there in the 70s, modern graffiti was born there in the 70s. Yes, yes. And, and as you stated that you've done a lot of ethnographic work and uh, the artists have mentioned that they do not need any sort of a right. They're fine by just painting it out on the walls of other people or uh, in the public space. Yes, the, many of them they have they have sourced. Uh, many of them, not all. Eh? I'll say uh, yeah. the variety of artists that I have interviewed is so so wide. I mean, I have collected so different answers. I would say from the most enthusiastic about uh, copyright to the you know on the other end of the spectrum to the guy that really doesn't care. And so we cannot really. Uh, give a precise answer on, you know, the desires of, of, of a category which is so different within. Let's say. But having said that, what I have also uh, perceived is that an interest in relying on copyright arises when the appropriation takes place. So basically, the appropriation, especially by a corporation or by someone that wants to profit out of the art, this act of appropriation triggers an interest in the mind of, of, of the artist. So basically, what can we infer from this? That corporate is not, is not for sure a trigger, does not really give motivation to artists to paint in the street, right? that's quite obvious and accepted. So you may be aware that, especially in the US, uh, copyright is uh, justified uh, in an utilitarian way, right? Copyright is there because it encourages artists to, 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 to paint canvases, musicians to, to, to compose music, and so these- uh, Right, incentivizations. The, of course, this does not apply. This theoretical justification philosophy uh, does not apply to street art, 
uh, at all because I haven't really found any artist that has said to me, look, I paint in the street because uh, uh, corporate pushes me to do what? But my point here is, this also happens in the field of fine art. Because if you also ask to many fine artists, especially young, at the, in the early stage of their careers, if you ask them, why do you paint canvases? Why do you, did you start paint canvases? They will reply to you, because I love it. Not because, right. not because I want to charge royalty, I want to, to, to charge royalty in yeah. case. So, I mean... Uh, and this, this does not, this does not, I mean, does not surprise me because also in other fields of creativity, I mean, also musicians. Also uh, music. Um, um, uh, allora vuoi che scendo poi lasciarmelo sotto la buchetta? Magari Excuse sotto me? La... Sotto okay. la buchetta va benissimo. Sotto la buchetta è perfetto. Secondo me pure. Ciao, grazie. Prego. Ok. <laughs> Ciao, Filippo. <laughs> ok, so, uh, just, just coming back to, to what I said. So, I mean, the utilitarian function is not real. The utilitarian function theory of corporate does not apply to street art at all, of course. So, um, having said that, your, your question was, but how can, we re how can we really rely on copyright in those countries where there is no real much appreciation of these forms of art, right? This was your original right. question. Like back in India, if you ask me, we do not have uh, any such a case law pertaining to graffiti. And second, uh, we have uh, anything that you scribble on the wall would be called vandalism. So they don't even talk about graffiti as such. But you have forms of art in public, right? In India. Uh, you have forms of art in public. They are not graffiti. They are not uh, uh, labeled la as street art. But you do have uh, art in public spaces, right? Yes, we do have uncommissioned art that, that's there in the public. And uh, how does... Uh, how do people behave? How do people perceive this uh, art in public in India? They, they actually, they, yeah, yes, uh, they consider the, it to be aesthetic and ephemeral as it was uh, discussed before this presentation. So that's, that's always there, but a uh, lot of appropriation is not much happening, which is why, as you said, that nobody is um, vouching for a copyright uh, and there's no suit as such. But that I, I was actually uh, taking, um, I was researching for my master's under this topic is the reason I, I was really interested in looking forward to the presentation. So if you may allow, I have two more questions. I'm sure I'm not eating up others' time. Okay, uh, so this is uh, regarding copyright itself. That is there any law or provision which speaks of the fact that when you own the medium, you can then only advocate your moral rights? And if uh, that's not the case, is art and property severable? Can the tangible medium be separated from the intangible so that we can vouch for better moral rights for the artists? Okay, uh, as, you, as, you, as, you, as you correctly pointed out, there are, I mean, there is a difference no, between the intangible and tangible side. But the artist is able to enforce the moral right of integrity even if he or she does not on any more the tangible support, right? Uh, this is quite obvious because the, 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 the artwork can be saved, can be saved at least in those jurisdictions that allow artists to prevent uh, the destruction of the art. This is, this is not accepted in, in, in many jurisdictions. For example, um, in the UK, uh, there is no provision which actually authorizes that allows the artist to, you know, rely on the moral right of integrity to save the artwork from destruction. The same happens uh, in Italy, unfortunately. And uh, so uh, the, the ownership of the tangible medium is not a requirement for enforcing the moral right of integrity. Actually, okay. that's quite obvious because if the artist does have the ownership of the tangible medium, it, it's his stuff. So, I mean, he's in control of the tangible support. So probably there is, 
but of course there might be the need to stop others from using a reproduct a, a reproduct a, repro, a reproduce image of that so for example um, a street artist would be able to to stop others from using uh, you know a representation of the artwork uh, so a copy a photograph in an undesired context, in a, a context which is not accepted by the artist, right? But uh, I mean, the tangible ownership, the ownership of the tangible support at all is not a requirement, at all, no, of course. Uh, the other question was, you, you, you said you, you have two questions, right? Yes, yes, uh, this, yeah. this, this is the last one. Okay. So uh, many graffiti work is in a coded language, which only the peer artists or the graffiti artists can perhaps understand. They also say that they do it for uh, marking their territory. Uh, a, a few of them have such intentions. Now, what can be the criteria to determine the work of recognized teacher, as you've mentioned in Cohen versus GNM, under WARA? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure art is subjective and you can't find objective parameters to identify, but what, according to you, should be the criteria to determine when we have other set of graffitis like uh, one wherein just a coded language is given and none of the people, you and I, can understand what's there in it? Okay, I think the, the best assessment of the recognized status requirement was uh, established in five, in five points, uh, both in the first instance ruling of February 2018 and uh, the Court of Appeal a couple of months ago has confirmed that, you know, that was okay. So I think that assessment is great. What did the judge uh, say in, 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 with this specific regard? He said, in order to determine whether an artwork does satisfy the recognized stage requirement under VARA, we need to look at, you know, uh, whether the artwork has been uh, also cited in the internet, whether, you know, there are how many, how many, um, how many Instagram or social network views does the artist or the artwork get? So basically, uh, the judge there broadened the criteria and refused to accept what was, was had been suggested by the expert for the plain, for the defendant, the, plain, the expert for the, for the property owner. Um, the expert for the property owner uh, was, uh, who is a professor of, of art, of history of art. Um, she wanted the judge to just look at academic works and whether the street art works in question had been cited uh, in academic works. So basically, uh, the, the, the defendant wanted the judge to use criteria that are mainly criteria used for fine art works, right? Whether the canvas has been cited in some academic publication. I mean, you, you understand that by using these very elitist, very elitist right. methodology. Uh, Enrico, may, yes. may, may I uh, add something to this? Yes, because uh, this, is, this is something I am uh, working on, uh, the, the, the notion of recognized stature and also the criteria that have been used in the, uh, may you unmute, may you mute the, the, this baby, I don't know. Probably that, yeah. So um, I, I'm working on this because uh, I think that there is uh, also uh, I, I agree with you the 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 the, the arguments of the judge in the five points case were very interesting uh, and also this enlargement of the criteria is uh, something which can be accepted. Uh, I have only the feeling that uh, we all know that uh, one of the reasons for which uh, the street art uh, instead of graffiti art as uh, this uh, has spread is also the back to the figurativis figurativism in the sense that it is uh, quite easy to understand so also for example you mentioned the the the, the how many times this is shared on uh, social network platforms like instagram may be a criteria and uh, uh, I think that, that we should pay attention because uh, uh, through this way uh, there is a, a risk to protect something which is very 
uh, commercial or very easy to understand for, for the public. Uh, probably if you consider some of the masterpieces of the last century, they are not so easy to understand. Just to remain into the legal, into the legal area, just consider, for example, the, the Brancusi case, which is a, a, a landmark case, of course, in art law. Uh, in that case, probably the, this, this work of art was not, w w w wouldn't have been uh, reshared by many uh, Instagram users. And uh, so, so we, we, I mean, we, we have to be careful because uh, to, if, if you want my opinion, uh, my opinion is that uh, uh, I do agree with the judge in general, but we have to be very careful about this because of course we cannot rely only on academic opinions, but on the other side, we cannot ju just rely on something which is uh, accepted by the, the, the large public because otherwise, I mean, uh, if, you, if you consider, for example, the music, we should accept only uh, Laura Pausini, we should accept only Coldplay, and we should refuse all the, all the contemporary music uh, for, from Schomburg to, to uh, yeah. and so on. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but that's what the law requires. The law speaks about recognized stature. So the law in America, the VARA, already introduces a meritorious uh, element, whether we accept it or not, because, and of course, several commentators, when VARA was introduced uh, in 1990, so 30 years ago, several commentators, uh, they were not happy because they said, this is, this is going to be against one of the general principles of copyright moral rights law. Yes, that, that's according, correct. According to which the merit, Absolutely. the merit of, of a work should not be taken into account. This is one of the, you know, one of the most important principles in copyright law. Either you write uh, the, the worst poem ever, the worst song ever, you still get protection. Yeah, this, course, this, this, this is quite a common, this is quite a common problem also in contemporary arts because, uh, you know, it's something like, like what Gombridge said. Uh, this is art if a critic say that this is art. So yeah. we, we cannot leave. And so I do agree in general. I mean, for, theoretically speaking, I, I do agree with this kind of approach. I only say, please be careful with this. And yeah. Just... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Once, once, once we have that provision, we need, to, we need to choose the work that does meet that requirement. Absolutely. And when choosing the artworks, we need to look at the kind of artistic movement, right? The kind of artistic movement, here we don't talk about fine art, we don't talk about uh, expressionism or about neo -realism. we talk about graffiti art and street art. Well, one of the main aspects of graffiti art and street art is that it is shared on social media. This is a, this is a, a I would say, a, it's an intrinsic element of street art and graffiti art. Uh, not because, also probably also because street artists and graffiti writers, they like uh, visibility, they like being shared, no? their works being shared, but I mean, it's a fact. So looking at how many likes, looking at how many shares of your art, inevitably inevitably become a factor of merit, right? Whether we like it or not. And I think the judge, Judge Block in-, in uh, Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, I didn't notice that we have several questions in the-, in the... Oh, Okay, okay, let's-, let's, let's it's, my, it's my first seminar on Zoom, so I do apologize. So uh, Tina's iPad, uh, I think that question is from Tina, not from the iPad is uh, uh, what if part of street art is to be exposed to bad weather or vandalization? Could this be considered part of this form of art? Are we sure conservation is suitable? Just a thought. Uh, just just let, let me collect. Uh, uh, Amalia said that uh, I would like to, to make a question regarding Banksy and the destruction of uh, his work during the auction. Uh, okay, Amalia. Uh, so Donato Capetta, okay, say so congratulations, okay, thank you. And also we have a, a question from Giovanni Cartito. So uh, I will ju just uh, reply to these very uh, interesting questions made by Tina, uh, because uh, 
Uh, he is a part of our, so he's a conservation suite bold. Uh, I, I forgot to say one thing, uh, that the conservation and uh, the restoration of the world uh, uh, should include, in my view, also the artists. This is quite normal in the restoration of contemporary arts. Generally, artists are, um, often they are committed to restorate the, the works. Uh, the fact that this is exposed uh, to, to the weather and uh, to, to, to other uh, natural elements, of course, is, is, is a part of art. But, but again, this is uh, uh, one of the intriguing aspects of the, this kind of art. And, uh, and so, in, in case in which we, we decide to restore it and to, 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 to keep this kind of or works, we should, we should try to intervene and we should take into account uh, also the opinion and in many cases also the, the intervention of the artist because uh, you know the materials, you know the colors, you know everything in deep. Uh, Enrico, I don't know if you want yeah, to... Yeah, I mean, I agree, I agree. As you said, it's part of the game. Yeah. Uh, it's part of, some commentators, they have even said, look, sc people screaming, the noise of the buses coming uh, through. Mm -hmm. Even the dog poo and the cat pee and the smell of the poo is part of the experience. So uh, um, all these, I mean, that's why many, many, several artists, they say, no, don't touch, don't touch it. I like it. I also personally like an art, or I like graffiti, I like graffiti tags, I like graffiti throw ups, and I like seeing the chaos around them. It's part of these of these forms of art. Yeah. Of course, these these enters clashes. This clashes with the preservation. Uh, but but for example, for example, when I showed the the the, uh, the, the, the works of art in on uh, the Berlin Wall, uh, probably someone noticed that someone wrote on it to "Stop homophobia," which yeah. is very interesting because it's, it's a kind of completion of the message of yes. of, of this Absolutely. work. So. Uh, again, it, it's not easy. So uh, I will just leave the floor to Amalia uh, and uh, uh, questions about Banksy and uh, the, the, the auction. And uh, finally to Giovanni Cardillo. Amalia. Amalia. Amalia probably left us. And so Giovanni, if you want to make your question. Hi all. Ciao. Um, so I have a question about uh, the two cases of uh, Mercedes and Five Points. Uh, they have the same roots. Sorry, because I'm a lawyer, so I, my, my brain worked like that. So I think if, for example, in Mercedes cases, um, I have the right to make my, um, my ad in a public street because, I don't know, I like perspective, I like how... Uh, the lights goes there and it's uh, I, I think is uh, the perfect set for my product whatever it is how can the um, copyright of the uh, of the pieces in that area can work with my I mean my bright uh, right to make my hat in that street or the other and uh, about uh, five points how copyrights can limit my fully rights of property of a building? Because, for example, if I if I am a writer or whatever, I know that the home that building want to do something. So I go there, I write with an uncommissioned pieces. And uh, automatically, his fully uh, right of uh, property is limited by copyright. How can this work? In uh, I don't know if I'm clear. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, first answer to, the, to this question: five points. I mean, there is a tension, as I said. Is a tension between uh, two, two right. rights, uh, two fundamental. By the way, two fundamental rights in Europe: copyright and property rights. So, we need to find a balance. It's difficult to find a balance. But I think VARA in the law finds that balance because VARA does say if the property owner gives notice, 90 days notice to the artist by saying, look, you have now, 90, he sends a letter by saying, you have now 90 days uh, to 
remove the artwork when the artwork is removable without damaging the, 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 the artwork itself. The property owner is, 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 is safe. After 90 days, he can destroy everything, okay. right? Okay. And if the artwork is not removable without damaging the, 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 the support, what the property owner needs to do is to have the artist sign a waiver. Mm. If, and which, through which the artist basically waives its moral or her moral rights of integrity, right? If the property owner does so, is safe, is on the safe side. Okay, but so she, in five points, the property owner didn't do that. Didn't serve right. the 90 days notice. And uh, right. so uh, that's why, I mean, some commentators also said, well, the five point decision is a boomerang for street art because uh, now property, owner, property owners might not be willing anymore to give, uh, you know, to give uh, uh, their property available for artists, uh, to make their property available to, for artists. But I would counter argue by saying, if property owners behave like the law requires, they don't have any problems. The problem is that many property owners, they don't know. They right, don't know. No, I am imagining. They are basically in the dark. They don't know about the 90 days notice. They don't know about the waiver uh, to, be, to, be, to be signed on a, on a document. So they just allow artists to paint and then they change their mind and uh, they destroy without and what 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 if are uh, uncommissioned i mean i have a building almost also abandoned but it's my it's my it's my home and i want to destroy i want to do something uncommissioned or illegal Uncom because we have a free oh, level we have oh. commissioned authorized and illegal unauthorized so illegally or uncommissioned as i said it's still in the us is still a gray area because the wrong English case I mentioned said, okay, the court said, said no, no way, if it is illegal, you can't really prevent it. But then, but then, then the Lara case uh, changed the, the scenario by saying, look, there is no provision in VARA which uh, uh, limits uh, expressly the right to prevent destruction when the artwork is created illegally. So right. it's, still, uh, it's, still a gray, it's still a gray area. So if I were a property owner, I would, uh, I would follow anyway VADA by giving the notice, even if it is created illegal, to be safe, let's say, to be safe. Yeah, right. And what about uh, Mercedes? But since, I mean, if you can, because I didn't really grasp the meaning of the question. Uh, for example, I want to do the advertising in uh, such a street, okay? Because that street, uh, for me, is okay to... Uh, like Mercedes? Like Mercedes. Yeah, like Mercedes. Uh, for example, I need to, the permission of uh, the authorities to do that, to stop the street and whatever. If I have the permission, I have a fully right to do my advertising over there. But there are some pieces, illegally or whatever, that limits my full rights to do my advertising in that street. I don't know if I'm clear. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is not, I think, uh, uh, the, the, this would not be a strong defense, in my opinion. Because, it's just a yeah, yeah, because, I mean, I would say the only defense that might be available is the minimis. So it's just, you know, uh, there is just two seconds, one second, but this, this would be okay for a video. A photograph... Yes, a photograph is different. I'm different because... Uh, a Rico, a Rico, I'm sorry. So if you talk about even a video, there was a case with a video of uh, Fiat Chrysler 500, the five, uh, uh, Jennifer Lopez was uh, driving... Uh, in a Fiat commercial, Jennifer Lopez was driving in the Bronx. She, she is originally from the Bronx. And she passed through, in the, in the commercial, she passes through, she drives through a mural of, painted by Tats Crew, you know, a very famous uh, yeah, yeah. crew of muralists. I mean, uh, th there was no case. There was just an out-of-court complaint, and then the case was settled. But I don't think... Uh, a de minimis defense would have been strong there because, I mean, it's uh, quite Enrico, hard. Enrico, yeah. just, just, that's a short remark from the practice. Uh, I mean, the, the, the situation is, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the same, for example, when, uh, when uh, in the case of movies, 
uh, you have uh, an authorization to yeah. to make a movie publicly, but uh, you cannot. You have to be uh, to to be very uh, um, careful about uh, uh, displaying uh, trademarks or, or works of art. And and just consider, for example, that the, the, there was the, the Jeff Koons case that you remember. I mean, in that case, of course, there, there was uh, the application of the minimis, if I'm not wrong. But, uh, but again, I think that the situation is not a new situation. It's a, a, a commercial use and a for-profit use of a works. So, I mean, it, it makes no difference. Uh, I think that we, we, we cannot apply in any case the unclean hands doctrine that was mentioned by Professor Bonadio before. So, uh, I think that this is not, not really uh, an issue, in my view, in the sense that it has been already solved into other areas and to, in, uh, in other forms of arts. I mean, in, in all the, 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 the movie sector, this is absolutely yeah. like... Al although, sorry, Giovanni, although in a case that I mentioned before, in the US, I'm going to get it back, uh, it, it offers... I don't know if you can see the, the, the slides. Uh, I offer Gale versus Homebox Office. Mm -hmm. That was a TV series. So there was a, a TV series, a film basically, incorporating just for a few seconds a, a graffiti artwork on the wall. No, there were two actors uh, walking through the street. And the judge there was said, oh, it's the minimis. And even if, even if the director of the movie purposedly, willingly incorporated the graffiti, that's, that's good, that's okay, does not, does not remove the, the minimis, um, does not remove the minimis, so, because it's part of the landscape. Right. Uh, but, 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 but I think, that, I think that was, that you got the point, was, Enrico. That was three seconds, this was three seconds in a movie, it was not a commercial of, you know, one minute, uh, it's, so. 30 seconds in one minute is not the same that in your uh, you know, world movie. Anyway, right. the, the minimis rule then needs to be applied by judges on a case-by-case -case basis. So uh, two seconds, uh, three seconds in a, in a movie might be okay. In another movie, depending on the circumstances, it might not be okay. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not a aesthetic requirement, aesthetic, um, you know, defense. Yes. And you, you also got the point, uh, Enrico, where, when you said that it's completely different in case of photographs. Uh, for example, in the Detroit case, of course, this is different because uh, in the photograph, this is a static representation of that work. So in that case, I have no doubts about that. Yeah. Uh, in all the other cases, probably a case-by-case -case analysis will be, yes. will be applicable to the case. So if we do not have any other questions, I see one new message from Giulia Priora. Quick questions to Professor Riccio. Professor yes. Riccio. Yes. So I find your so proposal. I find your proposal. Please may you Please. Use the microphone because I have an echo. Uh, yet I wonder how to possibly prevent tackle the problems of tensions and imbalance that are gaining power in the collective decision making you suggest, especially when lying on the table are cases with the public authority itself being the property owner. Wow, Julia, <laughs> you made you made the questions which. Uh, which deserves another another seminar. Uh, very 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 quickly, uh, I think that I think, uh, um, uh, um, probably if you if you consider the Italian regulation, uh, we should first of all uh, reconsider the the crime of uh, vandalism, uh, which is in our criminal code, in the sense that uh, I mean I'm not a criminal lawyer, so probably. Uh, I'm not uh, completely precise, uh, but, but uh, uh, as far as I can understand, in the case of vandalism, you have to damage a property and you have to make something which is, uh, uh, which, which creates, which makes a, a, a deprivement of this, of this bill. Uh, the collective decision would need to involve the public, uh, public building and uh, I assume that uh, what you want to say is, uh, is uh, in the case where the, the, the work, of course, is not committed and is not commissioned. And, uh, and, uh, Julia? Julia? Yes, sorry. Yes. My, connection, my connection is going on and off. That's why I didn't want to disturb. But yes, that's definitely one of the most significant scenarios. 
um, I was just wondering how, whether you already envisioned a way to enhance a little bit the position and the lack of expertise by artists. Because, I mean, including them in the decision-making process is, I think it's quite a valuable solution. Um, the problem is that we still face artists who are reluctant or inexpert uh, in the field. Yes. So yes. we don't have a strong representation net or, or representation bodies as we have in other copyright or creative sectors. That yes. was a little yeah. bit my yeah. this, is, this is a, a, a very interesting question. Um, again, I think that when you take a decision, it's never a completely right decision. Uh, I think that when you have to imagine uh, uh, a legal tool, uh, it's never a perfect legal tool. Uh, so I do agree with you. Probably the, 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 there could be this uh, lack of knowledge, this lack of expertise into the committee. And this is, of course, a risk that, that we have to face. Uh, yes, I, I have uh, I've considered this aspect. And uh, that's why I suggested a committee which is not composed exclusively by persons working into the, what in Italy we call superintendents, uh, mm -hmm. so into the, these public entities, but also enlarge to uh, art experts, to artists, uh, to people who have organized, for example, a fair or other uh, events on street arts. So people who have an expertise, uh, also lawyers like uh, uh, Professor Bonadio, for example. Uh, and uh, what I suggest is a kind of national committee and uh, something which, uh, which is not also local. And uh, with the involvement in some cases, uh, I don't know where, where you're from, but uh, for example, in Rome, in Rome there are many, uh, many works which are uh, strictly related to the place. Like, for example, in, in the Quadraro, where there are many works which uh, uh, remind the, the, the Nazis' occupation of, of that area. Uh, so in that case, so in, in my view at least, I think that also the population should be involved in this, this kind of, of, uh, of decision. Uh, well, what I suggest is, is a collective decision. Uh, something which is not left uh, only on art experts, but something which is uh, uh, which which uh, embodies uh, all the persons who are in in, in any case uh, involved in this kind of decision, which are also affected by the decision itself. That's why I said in many cases it is very interesting to include also the, the, the representation of the people who, who live in, the, in that area. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if, I, if, I, if I replied to your question. Yes, definitely, thank you. I think it's very thought provoking. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a good way forward to, it, uh, in a specific scenario, to embrace the collective dimension also of the beneficiaries of copyright law as we Yes, as we are, yeah, struggling in the theoretical that's, field. That's actually that's actually the other side, of course. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I knew because well. my connection may may have problems. Okay, so thank you very much. We are definitely out of time. So first of all, thanks a lot to uh, Professor Bonadio for his uh, participation as uh, for his uh, very uh, wonderful presentation. So thank you, Enrico. Thank uh, so much. Yeah, I, I, prom I promise to deliver the next chapter for your next book in time. <laughs> this is this is a private issue <laughs> between Enrico and I uh, because I'm always late. So Enrico, thank you very very okay. much Thanks for your for time you. and uh, you enjoy. Too. And uh, you all, thank you for the participation to the seminar and uh, stay safe. And uh, hope that the next time we will we will meet. Uh, uh, in, Somewhere in London, in Milan, in Rome, or whatever. So thank you very, very much. And, uh, thank enjoy you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Ciao, Filippo. Ciao. Ciao, Igor. <laughs>